All right. So today we're going to begin our second day discussing the overlapping generations model. After today, we will have at minimum two more two more classes to try to finish up, possibly part of a third, and then we'll uh, we'll have your all's first midterm exam. So. I'm thinking the early, the absolute earliest your exam could be would be next Friday. All right, so let's talk a bit more about that on Wednesday, kind of firm up a date, but the earliest would be next Friday. And I'll just set a time with, with something like two to two o'clock to five o'clock, be okay with everybody's schedule? Nathan, how about you? Yeah, yeah two to five on a Friday. I'll just reserve a, a uh, room and let you guys take the exam in there. Okay, it, it may be this room, I don't know. And so you wouldn't have a recitation on that Friday then, All right? Okay, so let's pick up where we left off last time in our discussion of the OLG model. I think I had a few minutes to discuss the notion of an equilibrium in the OLG model, right? This is a model where um, agents are behaving optimally and markets clear. And so we want to think about the concept of a, of a decentralized competitive equilibrium. And we derived a set of conditions that characterize jointly um, households optimal consumption savings plan over time, um, firms cost minimization plans, where they set marginal product of capital and labor equal to the factor payments. And then a market clearing condition, which we showed was equivalent to this law of motion for the capital stock over time. Right. That's what I've written down here. So this is one of the, I guess, five or six equilibrium conditions in the model that we want to focus on today. Remember, this is a growth model after all. So what we're interested in doing here is seeing how these micro foundations for saving and consumption behavior impact the accumulation of capital over time. So we're going to focus exclusively today on this law of motion for capital and see how the savings behavior of individuals impacts that that evolution of the capital stock. OK, so if you recall, capital per worker tomorrow times one plus the growth rate of the population was equal to the per worker savings in period T, where the savings decision depends optimally on the two factor payments, the return to labor, the real wage, and the return to capital in the next period, RT plus one, where the return to capital is the rental rate minus the depreciation rate. It takes depreciation into account. Okay, so if we want to derive then a law of motion for capital in this model, what we need to do is substitute in the equations for the two factor payments, right? Well, what is the real wage? That is F of KT minus KT times F prime of KT. And what is the real return to capital at date T plus one? It's F prime of KT plus one minus Delta. So this is effectively the fundamental law of motion then for the capital stock. So KT plus one is basically equal to the savings function divided by one plus M, okay? Um, let's evaluate, so you can see immediately that this is a more complicated law of motion than what comes out of the solo growth model. Um, because it depends on the optimal consumption savings behavior of, of individuals. If we were to evaluate this condition at the steady state so that we could try to characterize the steady state position of the economy, then what do we do? We set KT equal to K star for all T, and we evaluate this law of motion for capital at K star. And what do we get? K star is equal to, let's see, S of F of K star minus K star times F prime of K star. In other words, that's the steady state wage 
and then F prime of K star minus delta. That's the steady state real return to capital divided by one plus N. So if a steady state exists, it has to satisfy this equation. Okay, so here's where we're gonna run into some difficulties in the OLG model. This savings function can take any form. We haven't really restricted the utility function, that is the preferences of individuals in this economy in any serious way, other than to say that utility is strictly increasing and strictly concave and is defined over the positive reals. We haven't imposed any type of functional form on the utility function, and so we don't really know what the optimal savings function is going to look like. Moreover, we don't even know what the production function looks like. We just know that it's neoclassical. It satisfies assumptions one and two from the previous chapter. Without more assumptions or restrictions placed on, on preferences and technologies in this problem, we can't even really be sure that a unique steady state value of capital, K star, satisfies this equation. So the basic OLG model without further restrictions actually implies um, a number of different type of dynamic behavior, okay? Let me illustrate some of those possibilities to you in a graph um, where we can demonstrate the mapping that this model implies from KT to KT plus one. All right, just to fix concepts here. This law of motion for capital implies a mapping from KT to KT plus one. We don't know what that mapping is. We can't solve for it explicitly like we did in the solo model because this is a nonlinear function in KT plus one. But the model is going to imply at least implicitly some mapping, some optimal solution that, that shows us how KT determines tomorrow's KT. Well, there's several different scenarios that could emerge. One, one scenario that's possible is that the steady state value of capital um, doesn't exist for anything with positive levels of activity. In other words, imagine that the mapping from KT to KT plus one looks something like this. I'll call this scenario A. This is, this would be S of WT RT plus one over one plus N. What if it looked like this? Okay. Can everybody see that okay on the, on the screen? Well, if, if that was true, then let's start with some initial value of capital. Let's say, you know, K1. And what's going to happen? Over time, the capital stock is just going to fall until you get to zero, right? where I've drawn this 45 degree line, by the way, to project KT plus ones, one period future, one period in the future. Um, another possible solution, of course, would be the nice one. That is where the model admits a unique, stable, steady state. Let's call that scenario B. In that case, What's the evolution of capital going to look like? Well, if this is K1, then to find K2, we simply go up to the KT plus one mapping and then project that back onto the 45 degree line. And as we saw in the previous section, the capital stock is going to climb until it gets to its steady state value, right? And this steady state is stable, at least locally. And how do we know that? The slope of the mapping from KT to KT plus one is less than one in absolute value. So at least locally then, this would be an example of a unique, stable, steady state. So the OLG model is certainly capable of predicting this outcome. 
But given, unless we're willing to make more restrictions, we can't rule out scenario A here, where the only steady state is zero capital, right? Starting from some initial capital, the capital stock just falls until we get to zero. It also can't rule out even more complicated dynamics. What if the mapping looks something like the following? call that C. How many potential steady states exist in this world? I see three intersection points with the 45 degree line. How many of those steady states are stable and how many of them are unstable though? Is K1 a stable or an unstable steady state? If we're dealing with C. The slope of the mapping is greater than one, right? And so K1 would be a repeller, right? Capital that's a little bit north or south of, of K1 would tend to either grow or fall. However, K2 and K3 are stable steady states because the slope of the mapping between KT and KT plus one is less than one in absolute value. So here is an example where you have multiple steady state equilibria, two of them being stable, one of them being unstable. Again, this OLG model does not rule out this behavior as a possibility, right? Unless we're willing to make more rigid assumptions about preferences and technologies, we can't predict exactly what's going to happen in the model. We have to impose further restrictions in order to, to generate a scenario that looks like the solo model where there is a unique, stable, steady state equilibrium. The basic OLG model, as we've described it so far, doesn't rule out scenarios A or C as possibilities. The solo model does, right? We only had to make very general assumptions about the, about the production function along with constant savings that's assumed in the solo model. And we get a situation that looks like B. Is there a reason why we only want one? Like what's, what's wrong with C? Um, well, there are some economists that, that do believe that we are described by a world with multiple equilibria. I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, but from a positive perspective, it makes the use of a model somewhat problematic. If your model predicts an infinite number of possible equilibria, then what's really the, what, what's it useful for in the sense of trying to enlighten us about how things might affect economic growth? Well, there are so many different scenarios that could play out there. We don't know exactly how the inputs would affect the outputs in that model because we don't know what the actual equilibrium is going to be. So one of the driving principles in, in dynamic macro is to, is to develop models that generate what's called determinacy of equilibrium, where there's a unique solution so that the model delivers an outcome that we can simply, we can take directly to the data to see if it's valid or not. There are econ macroeconomists, however, who, who, who think that, who have argued that multiple equilibria are extremely important in understanding things like growth and business cycles. So, you know, I'm, and I'm sympathetic to that view. That's not how we're going to, we're going to, we're going to impose restrictions on the OLG model to make, to give us determinacy of equilibrium. Okay. So how are we going to do that? We need to impose some additional restrictions then on utility or preferences and production. Um, the goal here is to 
characterize the steady state of the OLG model, as well as, as, well as its transition dynamics, right? And what we're after here is, can we generate a unique steady state? And can we generate one that is asymptotically stable globally? And the answer to both those questions is yes. All right. Now, here's the class of utility functions we're going to use. You may have heard of these before. It's called the class of CRRA utility functions. That stands for um, CRRA stands for coefficient of relative risk aversion. Okay. The class of, of utility functions we're going to look at um, takes the CRRA form. Now, what does that look like in practice? It's essentially a power utility function. So lifetime utility will be equal to C1 raised to the one minus theta. I'll talk about theta in a minute minus one over one minus theta, plus the discounted value of second period consumption. So C2 T plus one to the one minus theta minus one over one minus theta. Beta is of course between zero and one. The only restriction on theta is that it's a positive number. Now, why do we call this the coefficient of relative risk aversion? I, I'm not sure how far along you are in your micro theory class, but there is a coefficient in welfare economics called the coefficient of relative risk aversion that is related to essentially the curvature of the utility function. That, that curvature of the utility function tells us something about the risk preferences of agents in the economy. That is, are, are agents highly risk averse or are they more risk neutral? Okay, let me let me illustrate what I'm talking about here. So the in this class of utility functions, I'm going to drop the time subscripts just for a moment. We have utility is, is C to the one minus theta over one divided by one minus theta. Now, what would the first derivative of utility be then? The slope of the utility function would be C to the negative theta, would it not? bring down the one minus theta, it cancels, you're left with a C to the negative theta. What would the second derivative of utility be equal to? Minus theta, C to the negative theta minus one. The coefficient of relative risk aversion is defined as the negative of the second derivative times C divided by the first derivative. So in other words, the ratio in some sense of the second derivative to the first derivative scaled by the level of the variable in question tells us something about the overall curvature of the utility function, right? And that's going to tell us something about the risk preferences of, of these agents. Now, what does this ratio equal? Well, negative U double prime would be theta C to the negative theta minus one times C over U, U prime is C to the negative theta. Well, you can quickly see here that this is just theta times C to the negative theta over C to the negative theta. And what are you left with? Just theta. So the coefficient of relative risk aversion in this class of utility functions is just equal to the parameter theta. The bigger theta gets, the larger that number Think about what the utility function looks like. It's going to look highly concave, right? It's going to have almost this extreme kink in it for theta really large. As theta falls closer to zero, however, what does the utility function look like? Yeah. Linear, right? A linear utility function is someone that has is, is essentially risk neutral over different consumption streams. A highly concave or curved utility function where theta is a big number is, is a utility function characterizing someone whose preferences are, are highly risk averse. Right? They want to avoid big swings in their consumption over time and within periods. Okay, now we're going to come back to this in a minute, but let me let's see what this class of utility functions implies about the consumption Euler equation. That's the key equation in this model. 
Remember the consumption Euler equation was the marginal utility of first period consumption. So that's going to be C1 to the negative theta is equal to the discounted value of one plus RT plus one times the marginal utility of second period consumption. So C2 T plus one to the negative theta. If I solve this consumption Euler equation for the consumption ratio C2 T plus one over C1 T, what you're gonna get is that it's equal to beta times one plus RT plus one, all of that raised to the one over theta. That's what the consumption Euler equation looks like given this class of preferences. Now, what does this imply about the growth of consumption over time? C2T plus 1 will be bigger than C1T if and only if 1 plus RT plus 1 is bigger than beta inverse. So if the return to savings or capital exceeds the time rate of preference, one over beta, then the ratio, the, the term on the right hand side is going to be bigger than one, which means that C2 is bigger than C1. So your consumption profile is going to grow over time. Your consumption profile is going to fall over time. So you'll consume more when you're young and when you're old, if the time rate of preference is actually bigger than the return to capital. So if one over beta is bigger than one plus R, so you're discounting more heavily, then first period consumption is going to exceed second period consumption. So whether actually, so whether or not your consumption rises or falls over time doesn't actually depend on theta. It just depends on the relationship or the relative values of R and beta. Right? You got to look at me confused. Could you, could you talk about what beta means a little bit? Be beta is the discount factor or the, or the inverse of the time rate of preference, right? The higher beta is, the, the, I'm sorry, the lower beta is, the more you discount future consumption relative to current consumption, right? If beta is 0.99, Ben, then you value your second period utility almost as much as your first period utility. But if beta is closer to zero, you're going to discount the future a lot and put more weight, if you will, on first period consumption. So if beta inverse is small relative to the return to capital, that is beta is big relative to the return to capital, then you don't discount the future as much. And so you're going to want to consume more when you're old than when you're young. But if you're less patient, that is beta is a smaller number. So beta inverse is a bigger number. You want to consume more now than you do in the future. That actually doesn't have anything to do directly with your risk preferences, just the time rate of discount. Now, where does theta come into play? Let's imagine taking the log of C2T plus 1 over C1T. This is going to basically tell us the growth rate of consumption over time, right? Well, that's equal to 1 over theta times the log of beta times 1 plus RT plus 1. What then is the derivative of the growth rate of consumption with respect to the real interest rate? So imagine a unit change in the return to savings. How is that going to affect my growth, my consumption profile over time? That's going to be equal to 1 over theta, right? Because the log of a product is just the sum of the logs, right? So the partial of, of the log of C2 over C1 with respect to the log of 1 plus R is just 1 over theta. Now here we see where theta comes into play. What if theta is close to zero? 
then this number on the right hand side is huge, right? That's somebody that has basically risk neutral preferences. In other words, if there's a change in the real return to capital, we're very willing to substitute consumption over time between periods one and periods two. So small changes in the return to saving will then induce large shifts in our consumption profile, intertemporal consumption substitution between periods T and T plus one. That's if we're more risk neutral, right? We're more accepting of risk. What happens if we're really risk averse though? The utility function is highly concave. Theta is a big number. In that case, the right-hand side is closer to zero. And unit changes in the return to saving in that case aren't going to have much of an impact at all on our consumption profile over time. Because we're so risk averse, we want to smooth consumption as much as possible between periods one and two, right? And we're unwilling to shift consumption forward or into the future if there's a change in the real interest rate. That's, that's the key mechanism, by the way, that is, that is at play in these dynamic growth models. The way policy and different shocks are supposed, in, in business cycle models, I should say, are, are supposed to be propagated to the demand side of the economy is through this intertemporal substitution, right? When there's a change in the economy that affects the returns to saving, or the real interest rate, that causes us to either scroll consumption forward, substitute, drop our future consumption in favor of current consumption, or alternatively to substitute towards later in life, depending on the direction that R changes by. Well, the strength of that channel is really determined by the risk preferences of agents in the model, right? How risk averse they are. We'll come back to this in a minute because it's going to play a big impact on how changes in W in, in particular R affect our savings choices. Now, what does, let me, let me come back to the consumption order equation here for a minute and, and express it in terms of saving rather than consumption. Remember what C1 is equal to, it's, it's WT minus ST. What is C2T plus one? It is one plus RT plus one times ST, and then again to the negative theta. Um, if I multiply or raise both sides to the negative one over theta and solve it for W, you get this. I'm gonna skip some lines of algebra occasionally in the interest of time and just assume you guys can go back and double check my math. The WT is then going to just be equal to one plus this term here, beta to the negative one over theta times one plus RT plus one to the, let's see, theta minus one over theta times st. This term here, I'm just going to call this psi t plus 1 in recognition of the fact that it depends on rt plus 1. So the real wage in this model with CRRA preferences, I'm sorry, savings then is just equal to the real wage divided by psi t plus 1 where psi t plus one is obviously less than one. Psi t plus one is one plus this positive term, right? So I'm sorry, psi is bigger than one, not less than one. Be careful there, Greg. It's one plus this positive term. So if psi is bigger than one, what does that mean about the relationship between S and W? This implies then that ST, of course, has to be less than WT, which makes sense. We're saving a fraction of our wage every period. That fraction can change over time, but it's going to be, it has to be less than the wage. 
Okay. Um, I want to write the consumption Euler equation in terms of saving because I now want to analyze how the optimal savings decision is impacted by changes in the factor payments. Over time, as the capital stock accumulates, the real wage and the return to capital are going to change because they depend on the capital stock, right? It's the marginal product of labor and the marginal product of capital. So I'd like to see how then the savings behavior is going to change as those factor payments evolve over time as well. What is the partial of S with respect to WT? So if the real wage goes up by one unit, what happens to our savings decision? Well, savings is just WT over psi T plus one, right? Psi T plus one is independent of the wage. And so the derivative of S with respect to the wage is just going to be equal to one over psi T plus one. Since psi is bigger than one, this is some number between zero and one. This thing here is the counterpart to the saving rate in the solo model. In the solo model, we assume that the savings rate was constant, some fraction of income. Here, this derivative is the saving rate. It tells us how much of this extra $1 of income that we get in wages are we actually gonna save. That's what that partial derivative tells us. And it's gonna be some fraction there between zero and one. So you'll note here that the savings rate, S sub W, depends on the discount factor the time rate of preferences through psi. And it also depends on the real return to capital through RT plus one. And it also depends on your risk preferences through theta. So this thing here depends on theta, beta, as well as RT plus one. In the solo model, the savings rate is fixed and exogenous. In the OLG model, it, 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 it is not necessarily the case, right? Now, hopefully in a steady state, this partial derivative will be constant, in which case we can say that the steady state resembles the solo model and having a constant savings rate. What about how saving is affected by changes in the return to capital? So here's an interesting case. What if there's a unit increase in the in RT plus one? How does that affect our savings decision? Um, well, this one's a little bit more complicated, right? RT plus one is inside of this psi T plus one term. So we have to take the derivative through that term. Okay, well, that's going to be negative WT over psi T plus one squared times the derivative of psi T plus one with respect to RT plus one. That's going to be theta minus one over theta times beta to the negative one over theta times one plus RT plus one to the theta minus one over theta minus one. Now, fortunately, we can simplify this a little bit to make some sense out of it. Here's a minus and then times a theta minus one over theta. I'm going to transform that to a one minus theta over theta. We've got a WT over a psi T plus one squared. Well, I'm going to pull out one of the psi T plus ones leaving me with just WT over psi T plus one. Well, that's just ST, right? So WT over psi squared is just ST over psi T plus one. And then the rest of it, we can um, combine into a common term. <clears throat> 
So the, the last thing we have would be then a beta to the negative one over theta and a one plus R to the, let's see, theta minus one over theta minus one is just negative one over theta, right? So we're left with a beta times the one plus RT plus one raised to the negative one over theta. Okay, so that is what the derivative looks like. Now, our question is, can we sign it? So the partial of S with respect to W is always positive. What about the partial with respect to the real interest rate? Well, savings is positive. Psi T plus one is bigger than one. Beta times one plus R is a positive number. So the sign of this derivative all boils down to this term here on front, in the front. We have to consider some cases. Well, here's one case. The partial of S with respect to R is going to be negative if, let's see, theta is bigger than one, correct? If theta is bigger than one, the whole thing becomes negative. Alternatively, the partial of S with respect to R is positive if theta is less than one. It's going to be equal to zero, however, if theta is exactly equal to one. And that's a very useful special case that we're going to talk about. Now, let's think about this for a second. This is where theta and its connection to risk preferences is important to understand the interpretation here. Let's take the first case where theta is bigger than one. As theta increases to a value that's bigger than one, are agents becoming more or less risk averse? More risk averse. The utility function is getting more concave. Agents are getting more risk averse, which means they're not as willing to substitute consumption over time in response to changes in the real interest rate. So why is it then that savings goes down when the real interest rate rises? Think about this for a second. What is the impact on one's lifetime budget constraint of a lower real interest rate? I'm sorry, of a higher real interest rate. If real interest rates go up, then your return to savings goes up. And so in that sense, savings seems like it's more attractive relative to consumption, right? Because ultimately what that means then is that second period consumption is becoming cheaper relative to first period consumption. So there's this incentive to want to save and consume more in the second period. But yet when theta is bigger than one, savings goes down when R goes up. Why? Well, the dynamic that I just described is what's called the substitution effect in microeconomics. When, remember your intermediate micro, when second period consumption becomes cheaper, you want to substitute towards the cheaper good. That is, save more today and consume more in the future. But what is the offsetting effect in microeconomics that we have to account for when there is a price change and the real interest rate is a price? It's the price of second period consumption. There's substitution effects, but there's also income effects. Then when the real interest rate rises, what does that do to your lifetime income? Well, does it make it harder to pay off your house? Like you don't, yes, but you don't have debt. Think, Forget houses. I want you to think in terms of the model. There's no debt in this model. You put your brain inside of this box that we've created, which is this particular model, and use it as a lens to view the problem with. When the real interest rate goes up, what happens to your lifetime income? Your lifetime income is the sum of your wages and your return to saving. That is the return to capital. So higher interest rates are going to increase your lifetime income. Since consumption is a normal good, you're going to want to tend to raise consumption in both periods of your life as a result of that. Then here's a simple example. 
if you're if you're currently earning 5% interest on your savings, if the, if your interest rate goes up to 10%, you no longer have to even save as much to obtain to obtain the same amount of saving in retirement. That might actually encourage you to save less today, thereby consuming more today and in the future. Why? Because the income effect dominates the substitution effect. See how that works there? And that those income and substitution effects are intimately tied to the risk preferences of agents. When you're very risk averse and you don't wanna substitute consumption, you don't wanna shift between current period and future consumption, your income effect will dominate your substitution effect, in which case higher interest rates will cause you to lower your saving so that your whole consumption profile shifts up over time. However, let's say your theta is less than one and you're more risk neutral. Now you're more willing to shift consumption across periods and you wanna save a lot more today to finance that cheaper consumption in the future. So when theta is less than one, you're less risk averse. In that case, the substitution effect will dominate the income effect. And what about case number three? Why is that so beautiful? In that case, the income and substitution effects perfectly offset. And a change in the price of second period consumption, that is the interest rate, has no effect on your savings decision. Well, that's really interesting. Think about this for a second. If, if, the, if the real interest rate doesn't affect your savings decision, then your savings rate in the OLG model is going to be constant always, right? What does that sound like? That sounds like the solo model. What we're going to find out is that if we restrict preferences even more so that the income and substitution effects offset one another, the OLG model is going to end up being observationally equivalent to the solo model. So it's when those income and substitution effects cancel out perfectly, you get that the optimal savings behavior is to keep saving constant over time. That's why case three is so useful because it, it it helps us solve this model analytically quite easily, which I'm going to try to do before we leave today. Okay. So I know there was a lot there and I think in the slides we talk about this more, but your, your risk preferences, that is the size of theta is going to determine the, the relative power of these income and substitution effects. Where remember these are intertemporal income and substitution effects. The real interest rate effectively measures the price of second period consumption. You can prove that by taking the two income constraints and, and plugging them together, substitute out S, and you're going to get what's called a lifetime budget constraint or income constraint. Your second period consumption is priced at a value of one over one plus R. So as R goes up, the price of second period consumption actually goes down, the relative price. The, so changes in the interest rate are going to induce these intertemporal income and substitution effects, which dominates, depends on the level of the, the amount of, of, of risk, the amount of tolerance you have to risk, which so, is governed by the size of theta. Am I saying Richard? this correctly? So when theta is greater than one, the income effect dominates um, yes. so you save less today yes when theta is less than one substitution effect dominates so you save more today right that's right and then savings is constant when theta equals one that's right so with future can and then future con, uh, consumption is also impacted so when theta is less than one that means consumption is less expensive right or is that not related I guess well, no, the, the cost of future consumption is related to R. Okay. When theta is less than one, you're more, you're more risk neutral ish, and you're willing to shift your consumption between periods a lot when there's a change in the, in the relative price of, of intertemporal consumption. Okay. Yeah. 
and, and your level of risk tolerance will determine whether or not the income or substitution effects dominate for you, okay. right? These aren't necessarily the same for everybody, right? Some people will have more tolerance for risk than others. And one person's income effect is not necessarily gonna be the same as somebody else's. In this model, however, we've, we've assumed that everyone born in the same generation is identical, right? Okay. Um, there's one other, so I haven't really talked about technology yet. So we talked about constant relative risk aversion utility. The, the assumptions we're going to make about production are going to be straightforward, and that's going to be Cobb-Douglas. So output is going to be equal to some technology parameter A, which may or may not be time varying, times aggregate capital to the alpha, times aggregate labor supply to the one minus alpha. You all have done this exercise a bunch by now. You can prove then that output per worker is just a function of capital per worker. And in a Cobb-Douglas world, that's going to be A times K, little kt to the alpha. Okay, so the restrictions we're going to make on utility are CRRA preferences. And the restriction we make on production is that it's going to be Cobb-Douglas. Now, what do these additional restrictions on preferences and technologies then imply for the fundamental law of motion of capital? Let's go back to that equation. Kt plus one, remember, was equal to st over one plus n. Well, that's wt over one plus n times psi t plus one. What's wt? It's f of kt minus kt f prime of kt over one plus n times, what is psi t plus one? Well, that was one plus beta to the one, to the negative one over theta times rt plus one to the theta minus one over theta. Well, rt plus one is one plus f prime of kt plus one minus delta all of that to the theta minus one over theta. The notation I know gets a little cumbersome, but just bear with me. Okay, we can go one step further by substituting in our Cobb-Douglas production function. What is F minus K times F prime? Well, F prime is what? It's alpha a k to the alpha minus one, right? Alpha a k to the alpha minus one. So k times f prime is alpha a k to the alpha minus one times k. So the numerator here becomes simply one minus alpha a k t to the alpha. What happens to the denominator? 1 plus n times 1 plus beta to the negative 1 over theta times quantity 1 minus delta plus f prime of kt plus 1. That's alpha a kt plus 1 to the alpha minus 1. That whole thing to the theta minus 1 over theta. That is the law of motion for capital in the OLG model with CRRA preferences and Cobb-Douglas production. Now, take a look at this equation for a second, okay? If, if you're not quite sure how I got there, you can go back over the math yourself later on and, and figure it out, okay? In the solo model, when we derived the law of motion for capital, the equation was nice in the sense that it what? It gave us a, a, an explicit mapping between kt and kt plus 1. It was a nonlinear equation, but you could, you, could, you could solve for kt plus 1 as a nonlinear function of just kt, right? If you go back and look at the fundamental law of motion in the solo model, 
you had a KT plus one on the left-hand side and only KTs on the right-hand side. What's the problem here in this model? Even with further restrictions on preferences and technologies, we have not only KTs on the right-hand side, we also have KT plus one on the right-hand side. And why is that? Because the variable that affects savings rate is the interest rate you get on next period's capital. This is a nonlinear equation that we cannot solve for KT plus one as an explicit function of KT. It only implicitly defines KT plus one as a function of KT, right? This equation here, if, if it behaves nicely enough, is going to determine KT plus one as some implicit function H, let's see, of KT. But we can't solve for what H is like we could in the solo model. So even the OLG model with these additional restrictions on preferences and technologies is still pretty complicated. Now it turns out that there still will be a unique stable steady state in this model, but the proof or the proofs of them are a little bit more involved. Now, if a steady state exists in this model, and it's going to be given by some value of capital, call it K star, that satisfies the following equation. K star is equal to the right-hand side evaluated at K star for, for both KT and KT plus one. So it must satisfy the following equation. One plus N times one plus beta to the negative one over theta times one minus delta. You might need to shift it up a bit. Sorry, plus alpha a k star to the alpha minus one quantity to the theta minus one over theta. That's going to be equal to, let's see, if I take this k star and I divide it if it becomes the, um, the, the denominator here, it's one minus alpha a k star to the alpha minus one. So if a steady state exists, it has to satisfy that equation. You guys see how I got that? I basically just brought the denominator here to the left-hand side and brought this kt plus one to the right-hand side and evaluated the whole thing at k is equal to k star. Again, we're not sure if a unique steady state equilibrium with finite activity actually exists here. We have that, that has to be proved. And I'm probably going to do that at the start of the next class. What I want to do for the remainder of class today is actually look at this case here the case where the income and substitution effects are exactly offset because the analytics of everything are nice and I think it, you'll be able to make more intuitive sense out of it. So I'm not sure where in your lecture notes I am, but sometimes I skip around. The, the next section that I'm going to do is called, um, I may have skipped ahead in your notes a little bit, but, I, but don't worry, I'll come back to the other stuff in the next class. It's, um, I think it's section three called the canonical OLG model. Now, what is the canonical OLG model? Take the model that we just looked at with CRRA preferences and Cobb Douglas utility and make one additional assumption. Let's assume that theta is equal to one. When theta is equal to one, we have a special type of, of utility function and you have logarithmic preferences, right? Remember what the utility function looks like. It's U of C is equal to C to the one minus theta minus one over one minus theta. Well, if you plug in theta is equal to one here, you get an undefined amount of utility, right? But what is the what's the marginal utility of consumption look like? That's C to the negative theta, right? So when theta is equal to 
when theta is equal to one, then the marginal utility of consumption is what? One over C. What class of utility function has a marginal utility of consumption equal to one over C? That's gonna be where U of C is equal to the natural log of C. So the case in which theta is equal to one corresponds to logarithmic preferences over consumption. Now, if we're willing to make this assumption about utility, then lifetime utility becomes the log of C1t plus beta times the log of C2t plus one. And what ends up happening to the Euler equation? So the Euler equation is gonna take the following form. C2t plus one over C1t is equal to beta times one plus r t plus one, right? Just go back to the one we did from earlier today and plug in a value of one for theta, and that's what you get. What is the, now here's where it gets interesting. What happens to the optimal savings decision? Well, ST, remember, was equal to the real wage over one plus beta to the negative one over theta, right? Well, when beta, when theta is one, that's just beta inverse times one plus RT plus one to the theta minus one over theta. Well, when theta is equal to one, that power is just gonna be zero. And so what happens then? It's just WT over one plus beta inverse and so savings then is just equal to ah, beta over one plus beta times the real wage. And so what then is the savings rate? What's the partial of S with respect to WT equal to? Beta over one plus beta, which of course is between zero and one. And more importantly, it is fixed and constant. So in a world where we have logarithmic preferences, a unit increase in the wage increases the optimal savings uh, level by a constant amount. So the savings rate is constant when the income and substitution effects offset one another. A constant savings rate makes this model observationally equivalent to the solo model, which I'll show you here below. What is the partial of S with respect to RT plus one here. Zero. Changes in the real interest rate have no impact on the optimal savings decision. What about the law of motion for capital? How do logarithmic preferences affect that? Well, kt plus one was equal to st over one plus n, right? What's st equal to? It's beta times wt over one plus beta. And then we have this one plus n term as well. All right, so we have a beta over one plus n times the one plus beta times wt. Well, what's wt? That's f, so a kt to the alpha minus kt times the f, f prime, which was what? Alpha a kt to the alpha minus one. So kt plus one is equal to beta over one plus n, one plus beta times one minus alpha a kt to the alpha. Now that is very nice. And why is that very nice? The law of motion in this special case for capital expresses tomorrow's capital stock only as a function of 
the current stock of capital. Tomorrow's stock of capital is no longer on the right hand side in this weird nonlinear way that's not solvable. If this version of the model exhibits a steady state, then how do we characterize that steady state? K star is equal to beta 1 minus alpha A over 1 plus N 1 plus beta times K star to the alpha, right? which implies that the steady state value of capital can be solved explicitly as beta one minus alpha A over one plus N one plus beta raised to the one over one minus alpha. Just solve this equation for K star. Well, that looks a lot like the solo model where there is a unique steady state, right? Let's look at a picture to reinforce this idea. Again, when we have logarithmic preferences and Cobb Douglas production, KT plus one, can be, equal, can be expressed as beta times 1 minus alpha times A over 1 plus N times 1 plus beta. That whole quantity times KT to the alpha. We can solve for this explicit law of motion for the capital stock. Let's analyze the dynamics of this model. We're going to illustrate this mapping between KT and KT plus one on this phase diagram. Here's our 45 degree line. What does the mapping from KT to KT plus one look like? It's just some constant times KT to the alpha. Well, alpha is a fraction, right? So as K gets really close to zero, what happens to the right hand side? It's gonna get close to zero, but what happens to KT plus one for small changes in capital close to zero? It satisfies the anata condition, right? The slope of this mapping is gonna be really steep for KT close to zero. It looks like that. Now, as K gets really large, the other anata condition is that the slope of the production function, K to the alpha, gets pretty flat, right? And so over time, this thing, the slope of this um, curve is going to fall. And it's going to, and so it's going to intersect the 45 degree line exactly once. All right, this is the mapping from KT to KT plus one, which I'll call H. In this model, we can explicitly solve for it. It's beta one minus alpha A over one plus N times one plus beta times K to the alpha. There will be a unique steady state at the intersection of that mapping and the 45 degree line. All right, so let's say we start off with some small initial value of capital. What's K1 going to be? Trace up to the H mapping and over, and that gives us K1. Now project K1 back onto the horizontal axis by going over the 45 degree line and down. And we can then use that to find K2. Project K2 back onto the horizontal axis. And we can use that to find K3 
and on and on and on. And what you're going to find is that capital converges monotonically to the steady state. That is the exact same type of dynamic behavior we see in the solo growth model. In the OLG model with logarithmic preferences so that income and substitution effects offset each other and Cobb Douglas production, we get a unique, stable, steady state equilibrium level of capital with monotonic convergence. So the model effectively becomes observationally equivalent to the solo model. And the reason why it's equivalent to this, in other words, if you were to look at data and then try to describe that data with a solo model and this model, you wouldn't be able to discriminate between the two because they predict exactly the same behavior, monotonic convergence to the steady state. Why are they equivalent? What's the fundamental reason why they're equivalent? In the solo model, we assumed that the saving rate was constant. In the OLG model, we haven't made that assumption. But if we assume logarithmic preferences, income and substitution effects offset one another, and the endogenous savings behavior is a constant savings rate. So you get the same behavior, one is endogenous, one is exogenous. The outcome on capital accumulation will be identical though, or observationally equivalent. So in a lot of these applied problems for the OLG model, we'll assume logarithmic preferences because it makes the analytics easier to deal with. You can actually solve for KT plus one as a function of KT only with paper and pencil. Not in all cases. I'll sometimes give you cases that, that maybe have slightly different preferences or something, or you've got to do some other manipulation or trick to, to make it look nice. But that's the reason why we, that this version of the OLG model is useful because it, it, it reduces to something that looks a lot like the solo model. And the solo model is, is useful because it's easy. Y'all have any questions about that? Here's what we're going to do with the, the first half of class tomorrow. Um, I have not, in the general case, proved the existence and uniqueness of a steady state, nor have I proved the stability of that steady state. I'm not going to do the, la the latter, but I'm going to do the former in class. Your notes have a proof that's already laid out for, the, for global asymptotic stability. It, it's a it's a long and tedious proof um, that is just, it just takes too much time to go over in class. But I'll tell you that it uses the same basic analysis that we did for the solo model. Okay. The proof of the existence and uniqueness of the steady state is more involved than, in, than the one for the solo model, but it's not as complicated as that one. So, we will do that in the first half of class tomorrow, or Wednesday, is solve, is prove that the steady state in the model that has just CRRA preferences and Cobb-Douglas production exists and is unique. The proof plays out the same way that the, that the proof of uniqueness and existence did in the solo model, but we've got to analyze different cases. Why? Because we can't make assumptions about how big or small theta is. The proof has to work regardless if preferences are highly risk averse or more risk neutral. So we've got to look at a couple different cases, which makes the analysis of the proof a little bit more complicated, but they're still manageable in a classroom. The, the proof of the stability of that steady state is, is not difficult to do. I, and I encourage you to, to, to pr try to do it on your own or at least follow through the proof but I just don't have enough time to, to go through all that tedious algebra and, and substitution of different cases in class. So I'm gonna ask that you guys look at that on your own. That's what we'll do for the first part of class. The second part of class, we're gonna start talking about, and this will carry over into next week, this idea that the equilibrium that emerges in the, in the OLG model is not necessarily Pareto optimal. It's not necessarily the one that would be selected by a benevolent social planner. So the competitive outcomes 
Ad Adam Smith's invisible hand argument breaks down in this model for a very particular reason, okay? Now I'll talk about this more in the coming days, but the basic reason why it breaks down, the distortion or friction that is, that is intrinsic to the model is something called the existence of these things called pecuniary externalities. Now that's a big word that basically just means the following. Our actions today have an impact on the prices that future generations are going to face. How much we decide to save today in capital will affect the level of capital in the future. The level of capital in the future is going to affect unborn generations return to capital in the future. Right? So their preferences are not going to be reflected in today's market transactions. So there's an externality there because we're not considering the impact of our savings and consumption decisions on the welfare of future generations. In a model where there's an agent, a representative agent that just lives forever, those pecuniary externalities don't exist. So what's going to happen then is that there's going to be this tendency for current generations to want to save too much and over accumulate capital relative to what a social planner would pick. That's what I want to talk about and go through a demonstration or a small sketch, a small proof that illustrates that the, there are potential welfare improvements from actually lowering the capital stock relative to where they are in the decentralized steady state equilibrium. Once we get through that, and that's not, that shouldn't take too long, we're going we're to conclude our discussion of the OLG model by looking at fiscal policy and how governments can impose a tax and transfer scheme between generations. That sounds a lot like what you guys would recognize as social security, taxes and transfers that can actually help unwind some of these distortions that generate this type of overaccumulation. If governments tax the young and transfer those resources to the current old generation, this could discourage the savings of the young just enough to prevent that kind of overaccumulation from capital from taking place. And so we're going to look at how you can design a social security kind of tax and transfer scheme that can fix these externalities that are inherent in the OLG model. This OLG model, because it deals with life cycle consumption savings behavior, is an ideal framework to think about these types of intergenerational transfer fiscal type policies, right? Um, the guys and gals that work for the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget that do all of this type of intergenerational accounting use macro models that, that feature this type of life cycle analysis. Um, that should take probably two more full classes and maybe bleed into a third class. So we'll just kind of play it by ear. I think I might actually be going a little bit slower this semester because of this setup relative to this. And if that's the case, if I get behind schedule, I can always come in and do an extra session and tape it. And you guys can just watch it on your own or come in and view it in real time if you want. So that's, that's an option, but that's where we're headed with this. Okay. So at this point, you guys should be kind of through the solo model, have done plenty of those practice problems, are familiar with how to analyze them, to work through the math, how to characterize a steady state, how to see if it's stable and be playing now with the OLG model, right? How to set up the utility maximization problem, derive the savings function, characterize the competitive equilibrium, try to derive the law of motion for capital. So be working on that this week and next, okay? Any other questions? We good?